It's timing, you know. All right. Um, there's one thing I want to show you that I posted a, um, um, an announcement on that is something I, I neglected to mention last time, which, which is really useful when you're using those internal anchors to, to hop to a different place in the page. Um, so let me pull up the example that we had from last time and let me make the change. So I downloaded the zip file and I'm going to expand it. And here's my FAQ. Um, we talked about how to make the links so that if you click on one of them, it jumps to uh, that section of the page. Now again, a lot of it has to do with uh, the, the particular size of your browser window. So what I usually do, like to test this out to make sure it's working the way I want to, is I resize the browser window very small. Or at least I think I do. I resize something very small. Try this again. Resize the browser window very small, and then if I click on it, there I see it jump to the right spot. So that's that's probably good. All right. One thing that is nice to be able to do, especially with frequently asked questions, is to be able to jump back up to the top. All right. So you answer one frequently asked questions, get back up to the navigation so that you can do that um, and go to the next thing that you're interested in. Um, that's very easily accomplished. Uh, you don't have to even put in an ID or anything. You simply make the href of the link pound sign. So let me show you what I mean. I'll go in here and open with, oh, let me open Notepad. I could put at the end of each FAQ a link with an href of simply a pound sign and say back to top. And um, again, you don't, uh, unlike the other ones where I needed to make a special ID or something, um, you don't really have to do that there. You, you just say pound sign and that represents back to the top. So I could put it after each of the three articles and then I'd have the ability if I go and save this here if I click on that I read the answer to the question I got a link to go back up to the top. That's especially good, again, if you consider a frequently asked questions page, that's likely going to have a lot of text in it. It's likely going to be a long page. Or like a, a company's uh, um, employee directory. It's liable to be a long, um, a long uh, thing that, that you want to just jump to a certain letter. Maybe you're not sure exactly how to spell the person's name, but you know, you know my name starts Z-E-L something. So you jump to the Z's and do that. It's also nice to be able to jump back up to the top. So that's something that is, is nice to do. All right. Okay. 
There's a chapter on formatting text, which is kind of boring. All right. So what I will do is I will hit the highlights of it and we'll try to find some good resource online that talks about HTML tags for formatting. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, and there is a chapter in the book as well um, that you can uh, um, look for that. Remember when we talk about formatting text, and again, this, this gets a little bit more abstract, but when we talk about formatting text, we're not talking about the way it looks, we're talking about what it means. So the formatting we're going to put in our HTML is there not for appearance, but for what's called the semantic aspect of it. In other words, we're adding meaning by putting it in the tags. All right? Let me give you an example. One of those examples is a block quote. All right. A block quote is where you have something that is longer than just uh, a, 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 like a one sentence quote. Like if I were to say, you know, if you were to quote me saying, good morning class, it's cold outside. You could just include that right within the body of your paragraph if you thought that was worth quoting. But if you wanted to quote a whole, whole paragraph from a book or from another website or something someone said, it's a good idea to enclose that in a block quote tag. And so I'll put as part of this third article, I'll put a block quote tag in here. And I'll say something like CISS 216 is genuinely one of my favorite classes to teach. The students seem to enjoy it. It's fun grading their projects. So again, that's longer than just like a couple word quote or a sentence quote. That's a few sentences. So it's best to put that in a block quote tag. Now when we go and look at this, how does the browser handle the block quote tag? It handles it by indenting it a bit. I'm going to go and add even more text to it to make it more obvious. I'm going to go and just copy this text here just for demonstration purposes. So notice that quote is indented a little bit. It's indented on actually the, both the right and the left side. Yes? You could, um, you probably wouldn't wrap it around the whole quote. Um, I, I'm, we'll look at some, maybe some other ways you could do it. But strictly speaking, you could. You know, I mean, if it was, um, I'm just thinking if it, were, it might be a little um, awkward if it, like a, a real long quote like this, to have the whole thing be a link. Maybe not, I don't know. But you could, to answer your question. Whether that's the best idea or not is, is another, another uh, point. Right. Now again, 
This is where we're talking about the appearance versus the semantics versus what it means. If I wanted a paragraph indented that was not a quote, I would not use a block quote tag to do it because that gives me the look that I want. You tag things based on what they mean, not how you want them to look. All right? Because we're going to learn enough CSS to make anything look like anything. All right? So we're going to learn code that will allow you to indent paragraphs if you want them indented. We're going to uh, put code in to make, um, you know, um, things display different sizes or whatever. So just like you wouldn't necessarily put text in an H1 tag just to make it look big, all right, you don't necessarily put text in a block quote tag just because you want it to look indented like that. You put text in a block, tag, a block quote tag if it's really a long quote, all right, if it's a block quote. I always say my, my shorthand for this is don't lie to your browser. All right, don't tell your browser is something just to get a certain look because we can always change that look by CSS. Now, we've seen examples of CSS and we could, by default, the browser indents your block quotes. But we could choose to represent that a different way if we wanted to. I could, for example, go in and put in here a block quote tag uh, or a block quote selector and say that I want the background of all block quotes to be white. All right. Now when I go and do it, That's how it looks. Now notice this block quote. This is a real good example to, to, to review how the browser decides to display things. Because this block quote gets displayed, like everything on your web page gets displayed, by a combination of a couple of things. And those things are, first of all, your CSS rules. Second of all, the browser defaults. There's actually, well, there's that, yeah, we'll leave it at that. that that's, that's a good way to say it. We could talk a little bit more about browser defaults, but we won't. So, how does this block quote look? It is a white background, blue text, and it's indented. The indented part it got just from the default behavior of the browser. Browsers indent block quotes by default. Now we could change that to not indent it. We haven't talked about what the code would be for that yet, but we could overrule the browser. All right. But that aspect of it, because we didn't say anything about it in our CSS, it gets the browser default. It's white with blue uh, letters on it due to our CSS. Now let's look at our CSS. For the block quote I simply said, whoops, I simply said that the background's white. How come the letters are blue then if all I said was the background is white? And why does it default to blue? Oh, text Right, because of the blue in the CSS rule, all right? Because typically the, the default color is, is black, right? But notice what I have. I have a style rule for the body that says everything in the body has a background of yellow and has blue text. I then have a style rule for block quote which says the block quote has a background of white. Now the block quote is included in the body, right? If we look here, the, the block quote is smack dab in the middle of the body. So in reality, 
it gets the background color from the block quote tag and it gets the color of the text from the body tag because both of those selectors apply. All right? Both of those selectors apply. This is in the body and it is a block quote. Now, you might ask the question, how does it know to make the background white? Because both those rules apply, right? It is a block quote and it is in the body. Well, why didn't it make it yellow then, if that style rule applies? Well, it's sort of the style rule that's closest to the tag, that's most specific to the tag, takes precedence. In if there's duplication between uh, attributes. So in this case, I have block quote, the background is white. Well, the block quote is closer to this stuff than the body tag is, all right, in the nesting structure, that is. It's more specific, so that takes precedence. Now, since I don't specify anything for the color, then the color attribute of the body applies to it. This is sort of the cascading part of cascading style sheets. In other words, any element on your page may actually get its style from several different style rules that you have. So it's not like you just put one style rule for the thing in the page. It cascades down. In other words, the first one makes everything in the body have a background of yellow and a color of blue. The second one then overrides the background color for block quotes and makes it white, but doesn't say anything about the text color. Therefore, the text color from the body applies. Now, if I were to do this, What do you suppose would happen? The text in the block quote would change to red. All right. The background color white. Take out the and. The background color blue or the background color yellow? The color blue. Take out the color, okay. Well, let's 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 take votes. How's this page gonna look if I do this? I got I have a background color of yellow on the body. For headers I have a background of blue and a color of yellow. And for block quotes I have a background of white and color red. Okay. Almost. Almost right. I'm going to say it's changing. Okay. Okay. Let's see. And then we'll we'll discuss it. I'll do like I'll do like the weather forecasters do on TV instead of predicting what's going to happen after it happened I'll explain why it did. Okay, so what color, what's the background color of the whole page? The background color of the whole page is yellow with the exception of the header section and the block quote. So everything in the body gets a background of yellow except the header gets a background of blue and the header is this stuff and the block quote which is this stuff. Okay. Now what about the text color? The text color on the body is black. The text color of the header is yellow. The text color of the block, uh, the block quote is red. Right. Right. The default of the browser, because I didn't specify a background uh, or a text color on the body, it uses the browser's default. 
which is black, except for the header section, it uses a color of yellow, and the black quote uses a color of red. Now, some people were saying maybe the header would cascade. It would, except for the fact that the black quote isn't contained in the header. All right. Now, I'm going to monkey around with a little bit more. I'm going to get rid of to get rid of the color on the black quote. And I'm going to put a black quote in the header. Okay, not really a black quote, but we'll pretend it is. What's it going to look like now? What's blue. Pardon me? Background, blue. background, this is going to be... Ba background on the black quote, maybe blue, maybe white. Let's see. Okay. So now let's go and look at it. And that black quote, you can't even really see it, but the text is there because it's yellow on white. How did this happen? And the black quote down here is black on white. How did this happen? Well, the body, I said a background of yellow. So everything that's inside the body that's not a black quote or a header is yellow text. I'm sorry, yellow background with black text. Why black text? Because that's the browser default. All right. What about the header section? The header section has a background color of blue and a text color of yellow. A there is a block quote, however, in the header section. And since the block quote style rule is closer to that guy, it's more specific, then the header will be have a background of blue and a text color of white, except for the block quote which is going to have a background of white. And what's the color of the text? I didn't specify, so yellow. And this guy down here is white, because that's what I specify as a block quote. And the text color is black, because it's in the body, and I have not specifically defined it. Now. Sometimes I get a little ahead of myself on CSS, but that's okay because it's kind of fun and people like to play around with it and, and make their pages look differently. Remember, this is a selector. This says what on the page gets this rule. All right. In this case, by simply saying block quote, I'm talking about every block quote on the page. no matter where it's at. That didn't work out too well in this case, did it? Because I got yellow text on a, on, a, on a white background. I can do this. I can say, header block quote, color red. Okay. Okay. Or will the background be white and the color red? Well, let's see. is white. 
and the background is, is or the, the color, the background is white and the color is red. How did it get that? Well, first of all, what does the selector mean? Header block quote means the block quotes that are inside the header. So there's a different style rule for block quotes inside the header than there are for those outside the header. All right? One, one second. This one, this, the second block quote, applies to all the block quotes on the page. This applies to all of the block quotes in the header. And this applies to everything in the header unless something else comes and overrules it. Yes, you had a question? Yeah. So again, it can be tricky how this works and exactly how it cascades. The best way I would say it is that the more specific a style rule relates to something gives it precedence in applying. The order that they're listed in, <laughs> I've often said that any time a student asks me a question, um, I could answer with it depends, and it would probably be right. Does it matter the order? In ordinary circumstances, the order doesn't matter. The only time the order matters is if you have duplicate style rules for the same thing. All right. Now, why would you have duplicate style rules? That's kind of confusing. You know, why, why would you do that other than to just make a hassle for yourself? In the case of mobile web development, sometimes you actually apply multiple style sheets to the same web page. You have a standard style sheet that maybe gives it a certain look you know, uses the fonts that reflect your organization and the, maybe a color scheme that reflects your organization. And then, and you can do this a couple different ways, but then you might have a, some different rules if it's on a mobile device or some different rules that are uh, if it's on a desktop device. So you can apply two style sheets to the same page and in that case, the order probably is going to matter because you're going to like overrule some things in the mobile uh, style sheet for the desktop one. If you're just talking about keeping it simple and looking at, you know, kind of putting mobile on the back burner for now, um, then, you know, you're not going to be declaring duplicate style rules, in which case I could arrange those in any order and, and it wouldn't matter. It gets tricky, and I encourage you to play with it. Um, the easiest things to play with are the colors, or the background and text color. Uh, typically, most of the colors that you can think of to name uh, will work. We can go out and we can see the name of all the colors that are supported in HTML. And I probably have a resource for this in Angel. But here's a list of all of the color names supported by all browsers. And again, there's a lot of them. There is Alice Blue, Antique White, Aqua, Aquamarine, Azure, Beige, Bisque, Blanched Almond. Yeah. It looks, yeah, it looks exactly like this to me. Uh, I, I, I had like the eight crayon set, so I'm not like big on all these like, you know, 64 crayon uh, set things. Fuchsia. <laughs> Someone one time directions to their house said, I live in, in the house with the hunter green shutters. And it was like, huh? Yeah, yeah, green. All right, that's. Uh, I didn't hear anything, you know, other than green. Yeah, right, exactly. All right. At any rate, these are the things you can use. You'll notice next to it there's a coding, and we'll come back to the coding in a little bit, because there's some colors that there aren't a name for. There's a whole lot of colors out there, and there's only a name for. I don't know, hundred of them maybe. All 
All right? It's a whole lot of colors between, you know, different shades of blue. Blue and blue violet, for example. There's shades of violet that are more blue, shades of violet that are more violet. All right? And so we can, we can use a code, and we'll talk about how to do that um, later on. Our main topic, though, this is why I'm spicing it up with CSS, because the main topic, like I said, is not my favorite topic to talk about. It's a little boring, and that's formatting text. And I did this deliberately and talked about style sheets, because I think it's important to always have the mindset to describe the stuff that's on the page via the proper tag for what the content is, and then you can style it however you want to. All right. So, let's look at some other things that you can style. Um, one of them is you can emphasize a word. And that can be done with an EM tag. EM stands for emphasis. So if I want to emphasize the word snow in that sentence, I put an EM tag around it. Now an EM tag is an inline tag, so it's not going to like break and put another line. It's going to be all across on one line. And by default, by default, things that you emphasize are in italics. Of course, I could style that differently if I don't like italics. Maybe I want it to be blue and in italics, in which case I can do something like this. How could I make that emphasize tag be blue and in italics? Do EM? The, co the text color. So color, blue. Right. <laughs> And there is blue. Alternatively, I could say, well, I only want to do things that are emphasized in block quotes. Make it blue. And that would work. But if I emphasized this, because I define my style rule to be only things in black quotes, then the other text will remain black, whereas that text is blue. Yes? We'll talk about that in a little bit, but in an essence, you uh, change the selector. All right. Or right now, we're looking at selectors that are um, based on um, HTML tags. That's one way of doing a selector, by an HTML tag or a combination of HTML tags. You can also do a selector based on ID or class. Let's do a for instance there. And we'll, we'll come back to this more later on. Let's say I put in a style rule for H1. By the way, when I create these pages like this, I, I'm not trying to make a nice looking page. <laughs> All right? I'm trying to make it like obvious, the colors. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about like how to select good colors that go together. All right. But a, let's say I make a style rule for H1 and I make the background white. 
red and the color white. All right. That made all of my H1s that color. What if for some well it changed the H1 in the header because again the H1 is more specific to this chunk of code than the header tag is. This is like, you know, it, it, it's sort of a cliche for stuff like this, but people say that like CSS is like chess, right? There's, you know, there's really, you know, only a handful of rules in chess. You know, you could write them down probably on one sheet of paper, all right? But, you know, does that make you a chess master just because you memorize those rules? Obviously not. The different combinations and how you use these things together and all that, there is a, a myriad of combinations. So, you know, we're going to learn on a technical level sort of how to do these things, you know, and put these tools in our toolbox. And then part of our job going forward will be learning the best way to apply these things. All right? Yes, I learned that I can define it this way. What's the best way to do it? What, does, when, what do I mean by best? Usually I mean the easiest to change. All right, that, generally speaking, that's a criteria. That, that's a big criteria um, when we define, um, uh, when we define um, um, you know, one way of doing it versus another way. Now, let's say this. For whatever reason, this H1 we want to be different. All right? You might be tempted to say, I'm going to cheat and make it an H2. And then I'll define a style rule for an H2. Oh, wrong. Penalty flags are down. Um, I don't know what the signal is for that, but that's definitely a 15 yarder. Because you're lying to your browser. That's not an H2 tag. That's an H1 tag. You simply want, for whatever reason, this H1 tag to look different. All right? What I can do then is because this has an ID on it, I can create my selector based on an ID. And I can say pound sign. That means I'm using an ID here, not an HTML tag. Q3. And I'll do just the reverse, background white, color red. So now if we view it, all the H1s look like that, but this H1 looks different. Now, remember back the first day or the second day of class, I said something to the effect of there's always two aspects of web development. There is the tech ah. <laughs> there is a technical aspect of how do you do something. Technical aspect of how do I make that H1 look different than the rest? And I showed you how to do that. You can do that with an ID. Now, in theory, you could go on this page and put an ID on everything and make every single thing on the page a different color, using a different color scheme. Well, that's where we get into the design portion of it. You should do these things not because you can, but because it makes sense. In other words, I wouldn't make that H1 look different unless there was something different about that piece of the content, that I wanted it to stand out in some ways. You know, maybe, for example, um, maybe if I had uh, information about web development classes and networking classes on this page, maybe I would color code it so all the networking things look the same and all the web development things look the same. All right. The point is, is we're using these colors not just to make it look pretty, although that's certainly a goal. We want our pages to look good. But we're using it to help the reader, to help the user get, how do I want to say, uh, to, to, to organize the material for the user, to 
help them be able to focus on things. And again, as a general rule, like things should look alike, different things should look different. So, in this case, there probably isn't a good reason for making that a different color, but I did want to demonstrate how because the question was asked. In a way, this is like uh, an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? There's some people, you know, myself being pretty high up on the list, that feels unless, unless you eat a ton of food at an all-you-can-eat buffet, then you ain't got your money's worth, right? And people, when they go there, they're let loose and, you know, they're ready to roll. Being a judicious in styling is probably a better approach. You don't want to do things style-wise on your page just because you can. All right? Just because I know how to change the color of everything on the page, so I'm going to change the color on everything on the page. That's not a good reason. Be judicious and use the color not just as decoration or to make it look nice or to reflect your company's brand, which you will do as well, but to help the user organize the stuff on the page and help the user get visual cues. There's a whole visual language out there, you know, and it's so intuitive that we can look at something in another language and sort of get an idea um, of the way the page is organized simply by the use of fonts, the use of borders around things, the spacing of things, and so on. Um, I won't do that today, but we might do that in some other time after we've done some more CSS. So, yeah, I pulled up a, a web page in Icelandic, and you could s see the organization. Yes? No, that was my question. So many times I'll find myself navigating on the Internet and looking at something in another language. Uh -huh. But because the structures are similar, the layouts are similar, I can very quickly tell what they're asking. So, you know, Spanish is an easy one. Buscar, right? Search. Right. But some of the other ones, like you said, Icelandic, Denmark, uh, right. some of the Central American countries, you can't tell right away. Well, it, it's, it's, it's funny because um, I, um, you know, I, I, I'm a big, like, Winter Olympic fan. So, like, I'll, like, go to websites of skiers or skaters or whatever. And a lot of times, again, it's the visual language of the page that you can look and say, okay, you know, that probably looks like the page that has photos of the person. And that kind of looks like the page that has videos and, and all that. And it's communicated even without words. And when it's designed well, you have that possibility. And that's, a, that's an extreme example of it. But even for a native speaker of a particular language, you know, you don't want people guessing where stuff is. You want to organize your page to help them focus their attention to find uh, what it is that they're looking for. There's a, there's a great book on web design in the library called Don't Make Me Think. And the whole point of it is, you know, and, and that's not, how am I going to say that? That's not being condescending to the user. Or that's not saying, well, gee, the users are dumb, so you have to make it simple for it. Users aren't dumb, but for most people, simply going through Internet sites is not a form of amusement. Most people, especially like if you're talking about in a professional context or even as a student, you're looking for some information. You know, your job is to buy sprockets. Should I buy it from this guy or should I buy it from that guy, right? You don't want to be entangled in their website for hours trying to figure out the specifications of a particular sprocket, right? You want to be able to get to that directly and make your decision. Now, I will say, this is where entertainment sites might have a little bit different rules, right? Because with entertainment sites, typically you're not in there just to get information, but you, 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 know, you want to explore it and you want to have fun. So like some movie websites, sometimes the navigation isn't quite as clear. Why? Well, because you're not going there really to get a quick answer to something. You're going in there to sort of, gee, my kid was a fan of whatever the latest Disney movie is and they want to go and they want to 
you know, play around on the site or, or something along those lines. And we'll talk about that, um, you know, um, as we talk a little bit more about web design. My point is, the bigger point is, and, and to sort of put all this stuff together, number one, there's a lot we can do with text formatting. We've just hit a couple of things, and I'll probably hit a couple more next week on Tuesday. All right? So there's a lot of things we can do via text formatting. And then, via CSS, we can choose to show that a particular way that we think is going to help people focus and point their attention in the right direction. All right? Yes. So you, you're, what you're trying to do now is get us to understand the basic concepts. Yes. And at some point in the future, we'll be more advanced to understand why you want to change things. What's a best practice, for example, for certain types of text? Yes. Uh, again, uh, keep in mind, uh, yeah, keep in mind there's always the two ends of the web development uh, spectrum. There's a technical one and the design one. The focus now as we get started is just how to do some things. So technically how to do it. We will discuss again in, in subsequent examples like, well, what might you want to do? How many colors would you want to limit to? Um, you know, things along those lines that, that are more uh, of applying it and doing it. And again, the more we learn with CSS, the, the more tools we'll have to emphasize. Like, I haven't talked about borders yet, but borders are a great, great way to set something apart, you know, to set something apart to show this a little bit different, put a border around it. That automatically lets people know, hey, there's something different about that. You know that even if you couldn't read the language, that there's something different about this section than everything else. All right, we'll wrap up text formatting um, on Tuesday, and we'll get into images on Tuesday. All right, it is Tuesday, right? Between, between the way the semester started and the snow days, I'm all confused as far as days. Yes? The snow days are certainly yeah. the students up, too. But you've already posted Lab 3? Yes. So we should be building out what we did on Lab 2, following those instructions, and following the, the next two lectures? Um, I believe so, yeah. I, I typically like to get, you know, I mean, I, a, a lab is assigned this week. Typically, some of the material for it we cover this week, and some will wrap up the following week. All right, so yeah. All right, we'll see you in lab.